In this video, we are going to look at the last type of plant that we're going to study, and that is the angiosperms. So we've looked at the mosses, and we've looked at the ferns, uh, which mosses are the non-vascular plants, ferns are the vascular plants, but they're seedless. And then we've looked at the gymnosperms, which are vascular plants that use seeds. And the angiosperms are vascular uh, plants that use seeds. But what separates them from the gymnosperms is that they use flowers. And so here we've got lots of nice pictures of different flowers. So the first thing we have to do is we have to look at the actual structure of flowers and see how that is different. Uh, excuse me, or see what those parts are so that we can discuss the life cycle. So here's our flower, and what we're going to do is we are going to explore the structure a little bit. So if we want to start at the bottom, um, at the very bottom of the flower we have what's called the receptacle, and that is just simply this area right here, and that is where the flower actually attaches to the stem or the shoot. And it's, just, it's usually kind of a thicker uh, part of the stem at the end, and it's essentially just what the flower grows out of. Uh, the next thing moving up is the sepals. And if you look on any flower, these are just going to be, they, they almost look like little green leaves, uh, but they're not really leaves. And they are going to be underneath the, the flower. When, the, when flowers are budding, the sepals are actually what enclose the flower. So as you can see in this picture right here, um, the newly forming flower, the petals, are right here. That's always the colored part. Uh, but the sepals are actually this green part that actually surround the budding flower. The next thing moving up from the sepals is actually going to be what most people think of when they think of flowers, and that's the petals. So the petals are actually the colored part of the flower, and their primary purpose is to attract pollinators, to be nice and bright and pretty in the springtime um, because unlike gymnosperms, gymnosperms we said uh, dispersed their pollen by wind, but angiosperms are going to uh, disperse their pollen mostly by organisms, by insects, uh, moths and flies and uh, bees and hummingbirds that are going to actually get in the flower to get nectar which is a sweet sugary material going to get pollen on them and travel to the next flower. As far as the actual reproductive parts of the flower go, let's start by looking at the male structures. So we're going to be looking at the male, oh, that's not the male, there we go, the male structure of the flower. And this is going to be what we call the stamen. And as you can see on this picture, there are three stamens on each side. So there's three, or excuse me, I guess actually I should draw. There we go. Three stamen on each side. Uh, for in this picture a total of six. And that's going to be very important later when we talk about the difference in monocots and dicots or eudicots. The stamen is uh, made up of two parts. It's made up of the anther which is the top part, and that's what actually produces the pollen. So when the pollinators get down inside the flower, they will be uh, searching for that nectar, and they will get pollen from the anther stuck on them, and they'll carry it to other flowers. And then the part of the flower that, that the anther actually sits on is what we call the filament. So together, the anther and the filament make up the male part, which is the stamen. Now, if we want to talk about the female structure of the flower, female structure is a little bit more complicated. Um, the entire structure is called the carpal. Sometimes you will see it called the pistil. So those words are interchangeable with one another. And it has three parts. At the very top, it has what's called the stigma. And this is where pollen will actually attach. So if this flower were to self-pollinate, pollen from the anther would get stuck on top of the stigma. Uh, 
the stigma is held up by the style. So just like the anther gets held up by the filament, the stigma gets held up by the style, and pollen will actually eventually make its way down. So once pollen actually lands on the stigma, there will a pollen tube will form, and the sperm and the pollen will actually travel down this tube until they get to the micropile, which is just like in the gymnosperms, is an opening uh, by which the pollen and sperm can actually get to um, the eggs. And so all that happens in the style. And then the final part of the carpal or the pistil is what we call the ovary. And this is analogous to, um, good to point out it's analogous and not homologous, it's analogous to the uh, ovary of mammals. It's, it's actually the part of the flower that produces the eggs. So to do a very quick recap of this whole thing, uh, we have the receptacle, which is what the flower actually sits on. We have the sepal, which is the green parts that kind of uh, contain the flower while it's developing and, and until it buds and it splits open. We have the petals, which are the colored parts that we're all familiar with that attract the pollinators that have nice bright colors. Um, we have the male part of the plant, which is the stamen, and it is made up of the anther and the filament. The anther is what produces pollen. The filament kind of holds the anthers up. And then we have the female part of the flower, which is the carpal, sometimes called the pistil. And it is made of three parts. It is made up of a stigma, which is where the pollen actually attaches. The stigma sits on top of the style, and a pollen tube will form down that to the micropile so that the sperm can pass and get to the eggs. And those eggs are contained in the ovary, which is going to be... Uh, this structure here, the ovary, is actually going to become the fruit because the second thing that angiosperms have that gymnosperms uh, don't have is fruit. So they have flowers, and the flower gives rise to, actually the ovary of the flower gives rise to the fruit. Now let's look at the actual reproductive cycle of angiosperms and see how it's different from that of gymnosperms. As always, we are going to start with fertilization. Fertilization is where the egg and sperm come together and we go from having two haploids to having one diploid um, which is always going to be the zygote. So this happens inside the ovary. Uh, we said the ovary is what actually is, is where the uh, eggs are produced and that's where fertilization is going to occur. Now, if we zoom in on this picture a little bit, we'll see a very interesting thing uh, that most people are not aware of when they think of flowers. What we can actually see is that we've got a couple of different things going on. We have the zygote, which is something that we're used to having, uh, which is diploid. But then we have something here that is triploid, and this is going to be new. So this, this is a part of the flower that's actually going to have three sets of... And we'll talk about in a minute how that actually comes about. But this is called the endosperm. And the endosperm is actually going to eventually be a part of the flower that is going to nourish the growing uh, embryo. And this is going to be something that is new in flowering plants that we don't really see in, in gymnosperms. And so here if we look up a little bit higher, um, we have the endosperm which is triploid, and then we have the embryo which is diploid, and we're used to seeing the embryo. And then of course we have the seed coat, which which we have, it's, it's just like what we have in um, Gymnosperms, the, the only real difference is gymnosperms have a seed coat. They have the embryo, which together make the seed, but they don't have this endosperm. And this endosperm is going to help to nourish. It's going to provide nourishment to the embryo as it grows. Now, the seed is going to fall on fertile ground, and it is going to germinate, and it is going to become a plant. It could be a tree. There's lots of different, you know, we have grasses that give flowers. We have trees and shrubs and bushes that, that are flowering plants. But the ultimate end here is we're going to produce the flower. And just like we saw in the last 
uh, the first part of this video, the, the flower is going to be um, differentiated in its sexual structures. It's going to have the male part and the female part. So if we focus, focus first on the male uh, part of the plant, which is the um, anther there, well, the part of it is the anther, and that is what's actually going to give rise to the pollen. Um, very similar, just like in the gymnosperms, the, the anther is going to have microsporangium. If you'll recall, micro is always going to refer, refer to pollen and sperms, and mega is always going to refer to uh, eggs and ovules and whatnot. So the microsporangium is going to, by mitosis, produce microsporocytes. And uh, remember, site means cell, so these are small cells, and they are diploid. So again, whenever you go from diploid to diploid, or if you go from haploid to haploid, that is mitosis. That is not meiosis. So these microsporocytes get produced by mitosis, and then they are going to, by meiosis, give rise to microspores, which will be Haploid. So meiosis always goes from diploid to haploid. These microspores are really going to give rise to the male gametophyte, which is which is inside of the pollen tube, and that's very similar to uh, what happens in the gymnosperms. And just like in the gymnosperms, the pollen is going to find its way to the micropile uh, of the uh, flower and then it's going to actually fertilize. So by mitosis you will have a pollen grain will by mitosis produce sperm. So you'll be you'll have a haploid pollen uh, that is going to produce haploid sperm and that's going to be done by, by mitosis. And so now let's look at the female part of the flower. We have the ovary which is shown here. And inside of the ovary, it has ovules. Now, if you'll recall, the gymnosperms do not have ovaries. They did have ovules. If you look at the actual cone uh, of the gymnosperm, it has ovules in it, but they don't actually have ovaries. And like we've seen before, inside the ovary is going to be megasporangium, which, out, which are diploid, and they are going to give rise to megaspores. And that's going to occur by meiosis, so we're going from being diploid to being haploid. So now we have these haploid megaspores. Now only one of these uh, megaspores is actually going to become the egg. The other megaspores will have different purposes. They will actually give rise to uh, the endosperm, which is going to help the egg uh, help, help excuse me help the to nourish the embryo um, as it develops. So if we look down here. Um, we have the megaspores, which are haploid, and by this time the sperm have been made by mitosis and they have traveled down the pollen tube and they are making their way to uh, the micropile, um, at which point they will actually fertilize the egg. So here we have the sperm, they have moved down and they are going to come in and they are going to fertilize the egg. Now some of these other sperm will actually fertilize some of these other structures. Um, we have within the ovule we have antipodal cells and we have synergids. So it would be the combination of the sperm and some of these structures that actually give rise to the endosperm. The main thing to remember is that the endosperm's purpose is to actually assist the embryo in surviving, give it a little bit of nutrients. And the entire ovule, or excuse me, the entire ovary, if we want to kind of back up a little bit, um, here is the ovary, and so the ovary has several ovules inside of it, is going to develop into the fruit. Uh, so if this were an apple tree, uh, that would develop into the apple. If it were a uh, peach or a plum tree, it would develop into the peach or the plum. So what it, whatever the actual fruit is of the uh, plant, the ovary is going to develop into that, and it will help protect the seeds. Um, and also, you know, by, by being eaten by other organisms, it helps to spread the seeds. So let's do a very quick recap of the life cycle here. Um, if we want to start at fertilization, 
uh, the egg and sperm come together and that happens inside an ovule and the ovule itself is contained inside the ovary. Um, the egg, of course, uh, the zygote is, is diploid, but it has an endosperm around it that is triploid, and that's going to help to nourish it as it grows. And so the actual seed is going to be composed of the embryo, which uh, we'll talk about a little more later when we talk about monocots versus dicots. It's surrounded by endosperm, which is triploid, and that's going to help nourish it. And then that is all surrounded by a seed coat, which helps to protect the embryo as it's finding where it needs to, to be on land to germinate. So it's going to germinate. Eventually, it's going to grow big enough to produce flowers. The male part of the flower, the anther, is going to have microsporangium, which by mitosis will give rise to microsporocytes. And those microsporocytes by meiosis will give rise ultimately to pollen. And then pollen will, uh, once it lands on the stigma of the flower, will begin to make the pollen tube and it will, by mitosis, produce sperm. And those sperm will travel down to the ovary to uh, fertilize the eggs in various structures. Uh, on the female part, we have the ovary, which is eventually going to become the fruit of the plant because angiosperms are flowers and fruits. Uh, it has megasporangium, which are going to give rise by meiosis to megaspores. And one of those megaspores is going to become an egg. And then the egg will get fertilized by the sperm. And then that will create the embryo and the process will start over. Now the last thing we need to do is let's just make a quick comparison between gymnosperms and excuse me, that's not a gymnosperm, between angiosperms and gymnosperms. So here's our cycle for our angiosperm. Here's our cycle for our gymnosperm. So uh, some major differences. Uh, angiosperms obviously have flowers and they have fruit. Um, gymnosperms do not, but gymnosperms have cones, uh, which they use for reproduction. Um, the primary differences is we have in the angiosperms, we have the ovary, which is going to give rise to the fruit, and we also have flowers that have the different structures. And another thing is the reproductive structures of the angiosperms, the male and the female, are together. They're both in the flower, whereas in the coniferous uh, plants, the gymnosperms, we have a male cone, which is the pollen cone, and we have a female cone, which is the ovulate cone. So there's another difference between the two. And finally, another major reproductive difference between angiosperms and gymnosperms is because angiosperms have this flower, they can use pollinators to move their pollen from the anther uh, to the stigma of the carpal. And that's how they can Pollinate, the gymnosperms have pollen that is winged. So if we actually zoomed in on this a little bit, you can kind of see there's little wings on the pollen of the gymnosperm. And that's because they are going to pollinate by wind.